persistence to achieve their goals in the face of unprecedented challenges. And may they all and all of their families enjoy good health. We pray for the people of Nebraska, Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana as they continue to recover from the damage caused by last week's derecho storm, which damaged millions of acres of crops, continues to leave many without electricity, and left some towns such as Cedar Rapids, Des Moines, and Davenport with incredible scenes of widespread devastation. May all of those affected find the strength to carry on and recover. May these communities come together in their times of greatest need. And may we all seek ways to help them in doing so. And for all of the unspoken intentions of those gathered here this evening, we pray and say amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everyone. For those who are joining uh, via call-in method, the uh, call-in phone number is 404-397-1516. The meeting number is 146-707-0887. And the meeting password is 1234. And this agenda with those numbers is available on our website at jeffersoncitymo.gov. At this time, I will call the meeting to order. Mrs. Donaldson, roll call, please. Fitzwater? Present. Graham? Here. Hensley? Here. Hussey? Here. Kimna? Here. Lester? Here. Schreiber? Present. Vote? Here. Ward? Here. Wiseman? Item three, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Item four, miscellaneous agenda items. We have the Historic Preservation Commission here to present the Gregory Stockroot Award to Jamie Abbott. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I, my name is Mary Shans and I'm here tonight to, pre to present the Gregory Stockroot Distinguished Service Award. In 2004, the City of Jefferson Historic Preservation Commission created this award, Gregory Stockard Distinguished Service, to be presented to an individual who has shown distinguished community service in pre preservation efforts. The award was established in honor of Gregory Stockard, who served as the president of the historic city of Jefferson from 1998 to 2003 and was devoted to historic preservation causes in Jefferson City. This year, the Historic Preservation Commission voted to turn the selection and presentation of the Gregory Stockard Award over to the historic city of Jefferson in the future. But for its final year with the city, the commission nominated Jamie Abbott as the recipient of the 2020 Gregory Stockard Award. And Jamie, if you could come up. I would like to give you just a, a little bit of information and an idea about who Jamie is and what she's done for Jefferson City. Jamie received her BS in psychology from Southeast Missouri State University. And after graduating, she began her career within grant administration with the state of Missouri. And in that capacity, she worked with historic preservation through the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, which we know as HUD, the State Historic Preservation Office, SHPO, and the Missouri Main Street Connection. This historic background led her to a position with the city of Jefferson as a neighborhood services manager in 2013. And in this role, Jamie managed the Community Development Block Grant Program, city-funded neighborhood reinvestment acts, which included residential incentives to purchase within Old Town, uh, and commercial and adaptative, adapt, adaptive uh, reuse incentives. In 2014, Jamie introduced and the City Council approved the Rental Facade Improvement Program as an, as an effort to take a holistic approach to improve the historic fabric of neighborhoods and avoid demolition by neglect. She was a presenter for the State Historic Preservation Office Annual Certified Local Government Forum and successfully brought NAPC Commission Assistance and Mentoring Program called CAMP to the City Historic Preservation Commission. 
other projects that Jamie managed or participated in that led to furthering historic preservation in the city include the listing of Morrow Drive Historic District on the National Register, preparation of nomination of the Missouri State Penitentiary, reconnaissance survey of West Main Street, East Capitol Avenue Blight Study, Historic Southside or Munichburg Neighborhood Plan, just to name a few. Having worked with Jamie personally since 2013, I can say that she has been a great asset, not only to the city, also to the Historic Preservation Commission. And now, um, Mayor, I will turn this over to you for presentation of the award. Thank you. Jamie, we are so proud of you for receiving this award. Um, I was fortunate to know Greg Stockard. Uh, personally, he, uh, many of us did, and him and his family were very devoted to historic preservation um, in our community. And I know he would be so proud to be presenting this to you, and uh, it's an honor to present it on behalf of uh, Mr. Greg Stockard. Um, so this reads, in recognition of your outstanding contributions, furthering an understanding of our city's history and the preservation of its rich heritage that is in keeping with the dedication and leadership exhibited by Greg Stockard in preserving our past for the future, signed by Mary Shands, the chairperson of the Historic Preservation Commission. So congratulations, Jamie. We're very proud of you. And I know uh, also the effects that you've had on history in our community are long lasting. We're very fortunate to have you and your time here at the city. And now we know that you've moved on to other things as well and you continue to uh, positively impact our preservation. And we appreciate that. We'll continue to see the effects of that for years to come. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to you. Do you have anything to add? And I know you also have some guests with you this evening. Uh, yes, I have my husband, Michael Abbott, here with me, and my mother, Linda Lombard. And um, just to, you know, my time here with the city, I, I really did feel like that I, uh, you know, was blessed to, to help further and advance historic preservation along with other projects and activities. And because not only um, was it a job, but Jefferson City was also my home. And I had, uh, you know, a lot of, oh, you know, I just a lot of passion for making the town better and, and uh, getting old town not to be qu quite quote unquote old town as having a negativity to it. So um, I really am uh, blessed to, to receive the award and uh, uh, the award, excuse me, and. Uh, I am actually almost honestly shocked, but I am very proud to, to be receiving it. Well, it's very fitting, and we're very happy for you. Are there any council uh, comments? Uh, Councilwoman Ward. Hi, Jamie. Nice to see you again. Um, I had the honor, too, of knowing Greg Stockert and working with him on a lot of preservation efforts, and it's, it's wonderful to see someone like you receiving this in his name because you moved his, the Historic Preservation Commission further along in with the demolition ordinance, um, updating that, and that was a, a monumental task. Yeah. Uh, I think it lasted 18 months or so. <laughs> but um, it's an honor and I congratulate you. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. <laughs> Very well said. Well, at this time, I'll present this. If you would like to come forward, I'll come around and we'll get a distance picture. And Mary uh, Shans, the uh, chairperson, and then Laura Ward, the liaison to HPC, if you'd like to come up. And then council can stand up and just distance back here. If a couple of you want to just spread out. <laughs> just kind of spread out.
well, Jamie, you don't actually have to stay for the rest of the council meeting. You're welcome to go this time. <laughs> yeah. oh. Item five, we have a public hearing establishing the tax rate uh, and associated bill 2014. An ordinance of the city of Jefferson, Missouri, providing for the levy of city taxes and establishing the rate of taxation for the city of Jefferson, Missouri for the year 2020. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Madam Mayor. State statute requires that cities establish their property tax rates on an annual basis. Um, the rates that we are proposing for calendar year 2020 are the same as the current year's rates. For the general fund, it's 46 cents. And for fireman's retirement, it's 0 .0961 for a total of 0 .5561. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Miller? All right. At this time, I will open the public hearing for Bill 2020-14. Is there anyone here that would like to speak on the bill? Okay, and I don't think we have anyone on the phone. No. Uh, um, Emily, is there anyone signed up on that? No. Okay, so seeing none, we will close the public hearing portion and take up Bill 2020-14. Is there any council discussion or deliberation? Okay, uh, roll call please. Fitzwater? Aye. Graham? Aye. Hensley? Aye. Hussey? Aye. Kenna? Aye. Lester? Aye. Schreiber? Aye. Vote? Aye. Ward? Aye. Wiseman? Bill passes. Item six, there are no appointments this evening. Item seven, presentations from staff, consultants, and invited guests. I would like to invite Mr. Sanders. I'm sorry, Ms. Sinzi. Welcome. Thank you. I am here to present a little, a brief um, capture of our structural survey project for um, the Missouri State Capitol and Munichburg Commercial Districts. Um, last year, the city applied for funds um, from the Historic Preservation Fund grant, um, the same grant that we're getting ready to re reapply for again, um, to do a, um, a street level survey of our structural integrity of some of our downtown buildings in Old Munichburg. So why did we do this project? Um, life and safety issues, we all know about 200 East High Street. I think when that building partially collapsed, it made us all question about, well, what other buildings downtown could potentially do this? Um, where are our weak spots? Um, also intellectual knowledge of the health of our downtown. Um, we just had a, an EF3 tornado go through less than a mile away. Um, that has to have impact on your buildings that are that close. Um, and then there's always the impending threat of the big earthquake. Um, either way, those are, those are all threats to load-bearing masonry walls. So it's something we wanted to look at. Also funding opportunities. Um, I, I was digging through old files, I haven't been here for a while, um, and I noticed that we'd applied for a large historic preservation fund grant um, through the National Park Service. And we didn't get it because we didn't adequately identify the need. So sometimes when you're doing reports like this and it shows need, that's the leg up that you get to, to get additional funding. Um, here's kind of an outline of where we looked at. We couldn't do all of them. We had to kind of take a small bite to check out um, to see what our health would be. So we, we chose our National Register districts um, within the Capitol District and also nine buildings within Old Munichburg. The project itself, um, we sent out, we first communicated with property owners um, directly starting at the beginning of April. Um, we sent out project letters and also a, a, um, a questionnaire to say, you know, to see what was going on in the inside of the building if they were willing to communicate. Um, and that was something that the survey um, was put together by city staff, um, also Walter P. Moore, who was our consultant that completed this project. Um, once we, um, we also had, uh, in addition to, we also had a webinar um, to give the public an opportunity to give us feedback, ask questions, why are we doing this, where is this going. Um, we did that April 23rd. 
On May 1st, we ended up sending 41 survey responses that we received from public property owners, uh, from pu property owners, and also people that lease the building space. So we sent that back to the consultants. Um, but in mid-May, the consultants actually did their site surveys. They did not go in any structures. They did it all street level, um, but they were quite thorough um, from the outside. And July 15th, we received the report back. And this is all online, so <laughs> you, can, you can view it um, in further examination if you would like. But essentially, we spent a lot of time with the consultants on how do we rate these structures? Like now we know what we want, how do we, how do we present that information? And we chose red, yellow, and green. Um, green being that you really don't need any further assessment, but you, basically your building is in good shape. Yellow meant was kind of our, our broad category. They were very liberal in applying buildings to the yellow um, because that could mean simply that you need a little bit of tuck pointing done or it could mean that you, you really need to start looking at, at the structural integrity of your building within the next year or so. Um, red condition, you see we did have six properties. That means that, that an immediate attention was needed. Um, so once we got that report back, and those were really immediate attention in regards to life and safety. Either a cornice could fall on a public sidewalk, um, a wall could collapse. Um, we had six of those. And so those six were sent through the dangerous building process. Um, and then all other property owners received a letter with also their individual structural report. Which Jessica's gonna pull up for me now so I can give you a breakdown of how that works. Okay, so this is an example of a report that a, that a um, individual would get. Um, it's kind of hard to see. So on the, on the report, it talks about where this property is located. Um, you'll see up here, it'll talk about historic status as non-contributing and contributing. Any contributing structure within these historic districts are eligible for federal and state tax credits, which is something that we really want to incentivize because it gives property owners the ability to maintain the outside of their structures when they're doing large projects. Uh, if you also scroll down, you see that this property owner actually did do a survey response. So they told us what the inside of their building looked like and that helped out the consultants. Um, the consultants then provided a list of observations, their discussion, and at the bottom you'll see the recommendation for it. Um, so it's just a bite of what you, as a property owner, it's a free service that we provided to say, you know, you can, your building's in good shape, your building needs some help, or you really need to address your building. Um, Jessica, can you go back to the PowerPoint? I can't see very well. Oh. Okay, so one of the things that, that I don't like to do is I don't like to do a project without, with, and then come back and leave people, you know, well, you did this project and now I have to spend tens of thousands of dollars on the project. Um, so here's so some of the funding resources that we have av available. Um, we do have the Commercial Facade Improvement Incentive. Um, that is a, um, where people get tax um, reimbursements for their property if they are pr providing over $10,000 worth of work to their building. And there's, uh, as mentioned, also the Federal Historic Preservation Tax Credits, the State Historic Preservation Tax Credits, which can be double dipped. Um, so those are um, future possibilities that we're talking about. I, I know I've gotten a few emails about Main Street programs that would help some of the downtown buildings and businesses for um, in more ways than one. Um, also the Historic Re Revitalization Subgrant Program in which the city could apply and then have our own subgrant program for historic preservation. Um, the Structural Survey Report, there is a link to it. It is located within our Historic Preservation section of our website. Uh, please check it out. We have a meeting tomorrow, a public meeting with um, Walter P. Moore will be joining us by WebEx um, in the police classroom. So you have the option to join live in person or via WebEx and that is tomorrow night at 5.30. And if you guys have any questions or comments. Any questions? That was a great presentation, uh, Ms. Cinzi, and I think that it's uh, very pertinent considering that we've uh, we know the hard way that those things do happen with downtown buildings and it's important to make sure the structural integrity is is intact so we're very fortunate that this opportunity came forward that you can actually be proactive with property owners um, any discussion 
Okay. Thank uh, you. Actually, Councilman Fitzwater. Well, I was just going to make the comment. Our building went through it. I don't know how we got into the hundred, but our building went through it. It was a pretty painless process. We've gone through the report. I'll probably stop by tomorrow night. I don't know that we had any significant questions, but I appreciate it going on. I think it's positive for our community. And as I said, as one that went through it, it, they did a nice job and it was painless from our point of view. So I, I think that's beneficial. I do too. Thank you. All right. Any further questions or comments? Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Item 8, announcements by mayor, council, and staff. We have our council committee meetings at jeffersoncitymo.gov. Do we have any announcements for our council committees? Councilman Hensley? Thank you, a couple. Uh, the finance committee meeting um, scheduled for this uh, Thursday, uh, August 20th, is canceled. Uh, and the budget committee, uh, our next meeting is this Thursday, August 20th, uh, beginning at 5.30 p.m. It's currently scheduled to, to be here in person in this room. And then our, our uh, two meetings uh, currently scheduled uh, following that one are next Monday evening and then Thursday next week as well, the 24th and the 27th, uh, both also scheduled to begin at 5.30 and both currently uh, scheduled to occur in this room. Thank you, Councilman Hensley. Thank you. Any other? Uh, Councilman Hesse? I would just add that the Public Works and Planning Committee held our meeting last Thursday uh, morning. You may have seen some press coverage about uh, a large turnout of citizens affected by the recent flash floods here to speak. Um, and so we had a lot of testimony, um, I don't know, 15, 20 speakers maybe, representing multiple neighborhoods throughout the city. Um, I would thank Matt Marash and his team who get overworked these times in terms of the ability to get out to um, all of the residents that need somebody to come to their site to hear their concerns um, and I would just highlight the fact that you know we've had a number of these flash flood events the last three or four years in the community and I don't think there's been a ward that has not been impacted by them um, and that while the conversation in some part on Thursday focused on the initial concerns and, and immediate issues of a lot of residents to their property there was also a lot of discussion and concern for the larger issue of stormwater maintenance and infrastructure in our community and a lot of feedback from citizens that spoke to say when are we going to fix this or what can we do to, to fix this issue and so i just highlight that again especially for those that were on the council uh, four years ago and three years ago when these issues seemed to really bubble up to the top at that point as a major concern that we had a room full of folks here expressing a desire for something to be done um, and so in some of these issues aren't all just flash flood related um, there was a, a few folks here to talk about there was just a legit stormwater piping issue in their backyard that during these events might become a bit worse but it's an infrastructure issue as well and so I just uh, implore all of you to um, keep stormwater top of mind um, I doubt that's the last meeting for the committee where we will have turnout of folks that wish to speak. We, we carve out a public comment period at every Public Works and Planning Committee meeting for that purpose. I think it's related to a DNR or EPA regulation as well. So if you have residents in your ward that contact you, I would encourage you again to, to communicate with Mr. Marash and his department, Don Fontana, um, to try to address these situations. But just know that it's an issue. I'm sure the committee will look at it again. Like a lot of things in the city, we're going to have to determine how we fund these fixes that are needed. Um, hopefully we can avoid the next storm that, that causes damage and catastrophe for residents in another part of the city. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman Hussey. Um, are there other committee reports or council reports? And I believe Human Relations has rescheduled their listening session. Is that correct for this Thursday? Has that been rescheduled? Uh, I believe it was rescheduled. I know we have a budget meeting that evening. Um, so, uh, but if either of you find that when that's been rescheduled, I think they had to, to reschedule that for Human Relations Commission. Um, any other council committee announcements? 
Okay, um, I have a few announcements this evening. It's time for our annual United Way pledge uh, time, and you probably saw the uh, the decorated hat outside of City Hall that Jennifer Sakanik painted. And if you go and look up close, you can see all the different uh, places that you'll go in Jefferson City. So, oh, the places we'll go is the theme. And everybody, council members at your place, you have a pledge card. So please uh, fill this out. I know that we always have great participation from employees for United Way and from the community. So we always try to be a partner. They do a lot of good for our community. So please fill this out if you can tonight and drop it off in Jennifer's office. I would love to get 100% participation from council members because if we do, Steve Cole is going to do something. <laughs> and I'm not sure what yet, but it's a surprise. Wear a mask. <laughs> we won't even know it's him. Although you did dress up before. Um, so we'll keep that in mind if we get 100% participation that he will, he will entertain with something. So please do. Um, Let's see here. So Jennifer will, uh, yes. If we give through work, through a giving program there, does that count here? Or do you want us to do something separate here? Um, I believe for it to count for the city's pace setter campaign, that if you give even just a small amount, it can just okay. be a, a small thing. I'm pretty sure, but Jennifer would know that answer. I know several others. I think Councilman Hussey gives through the Y. And no, to me, I heard Councilman Graham will give double to cover your part, Councilman <laughs> Fitzwater. <laughs> yeah, he's giving double, so. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So let Jennifer know. I know a lot of you do give through work, so we appreciate the giving, and we would love to get 100% participation, and we want to be a good example for the community to give to United Way. They've done a lot through the tornado. Uh, they continue to do so now, even through the flash flooding and through the pandemic. They have meetings uh, every week that we are involved and engaged with, so we appreciate uh, that dedication to our community. And uh, my other announcement is going to be uh, from Cole County Health Department. I want to take a moment to reiterate the importance of taking precautions that we all should do. So uh, everybody can follow along with me. If you haven't already, I would encourage you to download the press release from August 7th this is on colehealth.org. It's also on the city's website. And some people might say, we already know that. We know what we're supposed to do. But in talking with Christy Campbell, the director of the Cole County Health Department that was here at our last council meeting, she said that she's noticed that uh, she doesn't want people to take it for granted or become complacent in this. We want to stay uh, very diligent. So for that reason, I'm going to share this press release again. And also uh, a reminder, the way this press release starts off is that many of our cases in Cole County can be traced back to travel or contact with the known cause. But as people return from summer travel, it's extremely important that they take precautions, uh, possibly not even consider travel, but if they do, make sure they're taking precautions when they come back. So uh, this press release reads, the Cole County Health Department is strongly recommending that everyone take precautionary measures to reduce the spread of the virus Wash hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially before eating. If not available, use hand sanitizer. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, or mouth with unwashed hands. Cover your mouth and nose with a tissue, elbow, or sleeve when coughing or sneezing. Adhere to all social distancing requirements and do not be within six feet of others outside of your household for more than 15 minutes. Wear a face covering when close contact cannot be avoided and social distancing cannot be maintained. Individuals who are sick should stay home. Wash your hands often with soap and water. Cover your mouth and nose with a tissue before coughing and sneezing. Do not share food or drinks. Avoid unnecessary close contact or consider wearing a face covering. It is a recommended that face coverings be worn when in contact with someone outside of your household within six feet for more than 15 minutes. Cloth face coverings offer some degree of protection against large infectious droplets, such as mucus or saliva, when speaking, sneezing, or coughing. This particularly protects those around the person wearing the face covering and helps people who may have had the virus and don't know from transmitting it to others. Cloth face coverings are not considered an acceptable substitute for social distancing. Interactions within six feet of a positive case for more than 15 minutes will be considered exposure regardless if either person is wearing a face covering. 
Cloth face coverings should be washed after each use. It is important to remove face coverings correctly and wash your hands after handling or touching a used face covering. Again, uh, please get your information from reliable sources. The uh, press release I just read is at colehealth.org. Please consider uh, downloading it, printing it, reading it, sharing it with your friends and family every day. We should have this memorized by now, don't we? Shouldn't we all know this by now? But we're finding that we want to not get relaxed. We formed really good habits, and we don't want to lose that. So we have a lot of uh, voluntary precautions in place, and our expectation is high that people will follow this. I commend the businesses and offices and schools and organizations that have put uh, precautions in place for prevention, uh, such as masks in motion if you're in an office and walking around. I've heard of several offices that have done that, that if you're moving, you should have a mask on. So uh, there are many great examples out there. We want to keep that going. So consult a factual source such as cdc.gov and again, um, health.mo.gov has great information out there. So um, with that, just as a reminder, I've got my hand sanitizer right here. We should all be carrying that. We, there we go. I want to say, show me your sanitizer, show me your mask. We've got it. So we should have that at all times. Any uh, comments or questions about that? So let's help us uh, get the message out. Okay, on to announcement B, the Bicentennial 2021 update. Um, as you know, last um, Monday, August 10th, it was Bicentennial Day. So we were one year from the 200th birthday of the state of Missouri. We celebrated that with a groundbreaking for the Bicentennial Bridge at the Capitol, which is the area where the bridge will be built. Uh, BJ DeLong was there with her family and uh, very pleased to uh, to have her involvement with that project and have her on site for the groundbreaking. There were several city staff and city council members there as well and appreciate this project and what it will mean uh, to our community. Um, any other announcements? Um, Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just want to announce that the uh, U.S. Uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, has allocated uh, roughly $31 million in disaster aid due to the tornado and riverine flooding last year. Uh, they have, uh, uh, the Department of Economic Development at the state is the administrator of the grant and they have conducted an unnet needs assessment and that is available as part of the action plan off the uh, ded.mo.gov slash disaster recovery website. Uh, they're in a 30-day public comment period. It ends uh, August 29th, and they're having a public hearing Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. to noon, a uh, WebEx meeting. Uh, information about that's also available on the website, and I'm just encouraging everybody, if they have any comments about what's in the plan, to go ahead and make those comments to them, because that will determine how the money ultimately will be spent. Great. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. And item nine, Lincoln University um, update. We don't yet have a student representative, but I know that class is beginning. Anything to add, Councilman Graham? No, classes began on August the 24th. Uh, that is our plan. So hopefully those plan does not change. Uh, so that's it. Okay, thank you. Item 10, presentations from the gallery on specific bills or resolutions. Do we have anyone signed up, Ms. Donaldson? Okay. Item 11, consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Item 12, bills introduced 2020-17. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute a pedestrian underpass agreement with Union Pacific Railroad Company and to accept a grant from the Parks Foundation in conjunction with the Bicentennial Bridge. Mr. Marash. Thank you. Uh, as clerk indicated, this is an agreement with the railroad. Uh, it'll it uh, basically provides for the permanent temporary easement to uh, for the bison bicentennial bridge across the tracks and um, also then it also provides for the um, the right of entry uh, for the contractor to get started and uh, all the costs associated with that are paid from the parks foundation which is different than any uh, it's basically uh, money that the foundation has raised to support parks in the community so it's not the uh, any tax dollars going to that um, and uh, the, the grants for a hundred thousand dollars to cover these expenses and and others that may arise as we go through construction so I'd be happy to answer any questions and there's a check mark uh, meaning that we'd like for it to be voted in one meeting 
so that the right of entry can be done so the contractor then now would then have access until this is approved he doesn't actually have access across the tracks councilman hesse thank you mayor i would request a suspension of the rules for this bill to be third read and voted on this evening okay there's a request to suspend the rules do we have any objections seeing none we will have a third reading of 2020 17. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute a pedestrian underpass agreement with Union Pacific Railroad Company to accept a grant from the Parks Foundation in conjunction with the Bicentennial Bridge. Thank you. Any council questions or comments? Seeing none, roll call, please. Graham? Aye. Hensley? Aye. Hussey? Aye. Kimna? Aye. Lester? Aye. Schreiber? Aye. Vote? Aye. Ward? Aye. Wiseman? Fitzwater. Aye. Bill passes. 2020-18. An ordinance amending Chapter 7, Boards and Commissions, Article 1, Section 7-2, Attendance of Members of Boards and Commissions Required of the City Code. Mr. Mullman. Thank you. Uh, this ordinance would amend the language uh, regarding attendance of members at Boards and Commission meetings. Uh, essentially, um, it's a simplification of the uh, attendance requirement where uh, previously it was a, a set calendar year after an appointment is was the measuring period um, this change makes that into a kind of a rolling 12 month period uh, to count absences uh, and, and that uh, that goal is two-thirds of the regular meetings or if uh, there are absences of three consecutive meetings then that would make a member of a border commission uh, eligible to be uh, removed from that border commission any questions uh, Councilman Graham? What would be the process of removing a person from their board or commission? Um, so th it doesn't change the, the underlying process. It would be a uh, removal by the mayor with consent of the city council. Okay. Thank you. Yes. It, it essentially, this, this determines this, t this amount of absence as being just cause for removal. Okay. okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 2020 19. Amending the 2019-2020 budget by reclassifying the assistant skating director part-time with benefits position to a customer service representative full-time position within the Department of Parks and Recreation. Mr. Greffrat. Thank you. As the clerk said, uh, this would reclassify the assistant skating director position, which is a part-time with benefits position, into a full-time position, uh, the customer service rep. Uh, this person, this individual, would uh, work the front desk at the link uh, in the evening. We think they will be uh, provide better customer service for our patrons and guests, and that's why we want to reclassify it. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Okay. 2020. 20. An ordinance authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute a grant agreement between the city and Jeff city of Jefferson and the Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission for the purpose of designing the apron maintenance project for the Jefferson City Memorial Airport. Mr. Marash. Thank you. Uh, again, as clerk indicated, a uh, MoDOT grant agreement uh, uh, between the city and MoDOT to uh, pay for uh, design, design and construction services for pavement repair at the airport. Um, basically, it's a 90% agreement. Uh, the funding portion for MoDOT would be 100. Uh, just over $143,586 and the city 10% of the agreement $15,954 and um, then uh, the companion bill will be the next bill to actually pay for these services. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. And 2020-21. An ordinance Ordinance authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute an agreement with Burns and McDonald Engineering Company for services associated with the apron maintenance project for the Jefferson City Memorial Airport. Mr. Marash. Thank you. So Burns and McDonald is our uh, consultant that's been selected to do airport projects for the city and uh, has, they have to be pre-qualified to do these. And so uh, this would actually have an agreement with Burns and Mac to perform these services that we just talked about and paid for through the grant process we just discussed. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. And 2020-22. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, relating to its financial disclosure policy and conflicts of interest. Mr. Mullman. 
Thank you. Uh, this ordinance um, makes changes to the city's financial disclosure and conflicts of interest ordinance. So when a municipality adopts an ordinance uh, regarding conflicts of interest and disclosure of financial information, state law requires that it contain certain minimum elements. Um, so this ordinance uh, updates our ordinances to ensure that those certain minimum elements are included. Um, this should not uh, uh, change in any material way uh, the manner in which uh, required reporters report those conflicts of interest uh, with the exception that in addition to being filed with the Missouri Ethics Commission that the reports also be filed with the city clerk. Um, this ordinance needs to be recertified and provided to the Missouri Ethics Commission every two years. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, 2020-23. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri authorizing the Mayor and City Clerk to execute a development agreement with Superior Home Improvement Team, LLC. Mr. Mullman. Thank you. This is a development agreement regarding 813 Madison. Um, so in this development agreement, in exchange for a cash offer of $750, plus uh, promises relating to the development of 813 Madison, the city would convey 1830, 1830 Madison to Superior, um, get the name right here, Superior Home Improvement Team LLC. Uh, Superior Home Improvement Team LLC owns the property uh, immediately next door at 8. 11 Madison. I believe that Mr. Holland is here tonight and Mr. Holland is a uh, representative of that uh, of that company and so essentially this uh, agreement would uh, allow 811 Madison to use 813 uh, Madison uh, essentially as one property and then there's uh, uh, promises to develop the, uh, the, 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 the 813 Madison with a parking space for 811 taking parking off the street uh, in a manner that's similar with the uh, rest of the properties on uh, on Madison and so the uh, city has uh, done a, a, a search and can find no reason why we still need 813 Madison so we uh, believe that this is a good way to get the uh, get the property back into private hands and back on the tax rolls great uh, any questions Councilman Graham? Oh, what is that property valued at? Um, it's, it's, do you mean the assessed value? It's I don't have, I don't have the assessed the value assessed off value. of, yeah, I don't have the assessed value offhand. Well, the previous assessed value I don't have, it was assessed at zero because it was owned by the city and we didn't do, um, we didn't do a, um, an appraisal on it and, and, and primarily that's because it's undevelopable by itself it's too small for anyone to put anything new there and so um, it's really kind of hard to do an appraisal that um, makes any real type of sense because you can't do anything with the property except in conjunction with other properties okay. Thank you. Councilman Hesse? Well, and I would add that, that this came before the Public Works Committee. Uh, I remember, I think, right? <laughs> yes. We, we approved it on. And, it, you know, a lot of the properties on that stretch are, are 50 feet wide, and this lot and his lot are 25. So this puts those together to kind of add some uniformity on that section of the street. Yes, and the, the agreement actually requires that uh, that the new owner go through a lot consolidation for those two properties. So kind of now and forever, they're together uh, in a way that's consistent with the rest of the block. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Okay, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Holland, for being here as well. Item 13, bills pending 2020-10. <laughs> An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri terminating and dissolving the High Street Tax Increment Financing District Special Allocation Fund and the Tax Increment Allocation Financing associated therewith, allocating and authorizing the transfer of said monies in the Special Allocation Fund, if any, to the Cole County Collector for distribution in accordance with the Act and authorizing certain future actions. Mr. Mullman. So, thank you. The, uh, this ordinance decommissions the High Street TIF. So, um, this TIF was uh, put in place 
back in 2002 for the redevelopment of the building uh, at uh, 900 and 902 East High Street, uh, which is uh, uh, the site of the O'Donohue's restaurant. The uh, that redevelopment has been completed, and uh, that redevelopment has taken advantage of all tax increment financing incentive on uh, under that project, and so now the project is done, and all the funds have been used up, and so under law, uh, we are required to now decommission that TIF, and so uh, this has been a uh, mostly a successful project, and it's exciting to be uh, get the project back on the tax rolls. Great. Any questions or comments? Okay. Roll call, please. Hensley. Aye. Hussey. Aye. Kimna. Aye. Lester. Aye. Schreiber. Aye. Vote. Aye. Ward. Aye. Wiseman. Fitzwater. Aye. Graham. Aye. Bill passes. 2020-11. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, amending Appendix Y of the City Code pertaining to calculation of building permit fees and establishment of building plan review fees. Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this bill would change the uh, method of calculating uh, the value of a new construction or remodel uh, project uh, from the RS Means method, which is a very large book. I'm sure you've seen them here in this uh, room, and a very detailed calculation method to a simple uh, international Code Council uh, building valuation data chart that they update uh, periodically, uh, I believe every six months, and we're recommending adopting it on a yearly basis. Um, that would help provide consistency on two similar types of projects for the same type of use and same type of construction. Uh, we really don't know uh, detailed of what the fiscal impact would be, but it, we believe it would raise up some of the uh, overall permit fees that we collect, so we anticipate a 15 percent uh, approximate uh, increase in some of the building permit fees that we collect. Uh, it would also uh, allow better communication between the development community and the owners of the properties. So when they were building a building, they could say for sure that this is what the building permit fee would be. So there's no surprises in, in, in that regard. The second part of this bill uh, would create what we're calling a, uh, a plan review down payment, if you will, uh, that could be applied towards the uh, building permit. So what we'd like to do is capture 20% of what the building permit fee would be when a uh, architecturally designed plan for a, uh, a building is submitted that would cover help cover the review. Um, we're requesting this because quite often uh, the project may not go through and we spent days reviewing the plan or uh, in one recent case uh, the, uh, the company decided to throw out one plan after we reviewed it came in with the second plan and then actually came in with a third so we're doing three times as much work in that regard so just capturing part of that 20 percent for sure is something we'd like to do and with that we're anticipating I think uh, maybe a $7,500 increase in in uh, uh, fees just for those projects that don't you know actually come to uh, completion and with that um, I'd be glad to answer any questions this did go through the uh, uh, we did survey the development community and it's gone to the public works and planning committee Thank you, Mr. Sanders. Any questions or deliberation? Uh, roll call, please. Hussey? Aye. Kimna? Aye. Lester? Aye. Schreiber? Aye. Vote? Aye. Ward? Aye. Wiseman? Fitzwater? Aye. Graham? Aye. Hensley? Aye. Bill passes. 2020-12. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, amending Chapter 8, Buildings and Building Regulations and Appendix Y of the City Code pertaining to establishment of, establishment of water conditioning contractor license and fees thereof. Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Currently, right now, it requires a master's or journeyman's uh, uh, plumbing license to install and service uh, water softening conditioning uh, systems. Uh, uh, the water softener industry, they approached the plumbing board and said, is there some way we can have a special conditioner's license? Uh, so uh, uh, they came up with the, uh, the concept of issuing a water conditioning contractor's license upon a, uh, passing a certification test by the Water Quality Association. And uh, that, then we could issue those uh, special contracting licenses to the water softening companies. Um, the fiscal impact is minimal. We figure we may get $150 uh, or uh, uh, for the first three years for, for the license fee, then an additional 30 for, from each company annually after that. So if there's two or three companies, 300 to $600 initially, and then $30 for each company after uh, the three-year period. Um, this uh, has gone through the plumbing uh, licensing board and through uh, public works and planning. And of course, uh, we also reached out to the, uh, the, the trade industry also. I'd be glad to answer any other questions. Any questions or deliberation? We have a substitute. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes. 
Yeah, uh, we made an error. We uh, we omitted the thirty dollar annual fee after the first three years, uh, and that's the only change to that substitute bill. Okay. Do we have a motion to uh, take up substitute twenty twenty twelve? So moved. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. And uh, all in favor of accepting the substitute, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we'll take up 2020-12 as substituted. Any further council discussion or deliberation? Uh, roll call, please. Kimna? Aye. Lester? Aye. Schreiber? Aye. Vote? Aye. Ward? Aye. Wiseman? Fitzwater? Aye. Graham? Aye. Hensley? Aye. Hussey? Aye. Bill passes. 2020-13. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri adopting a budget and personnel classification plan for the City for the period of November 1, 2020 to October 31, 2021 and appropriating money in the City Treasury to pay the cost of operating the City Government during that period in accordance with the budget. Ms. Miller? Thank you, Madam Mayor. As the, as the clerk indicated, this is the budget for fiscal year 2021 and as Budget Chair Hensley mentioned earlier, the council discussions on the budget are continuing uh, with this Thursday evening. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Hensley. Uh, Madam Mayor, I'd request that uh, this bill be placed on the informal calendar. Okay, any further discussion? All right, that is on the informal. 2020-14 has already been taken up. 2020-15. An ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri amending the fiscal year 2019-2020 budget of the City of Jefferson, Missouri by supplementally appropriating funds for gap financing under the blight removal funding agreement with the Housing Authority. Mr. Mullman. Thank you. This ordinance would supplementally appropriate uh, $50,357.60 uh, to cover the city's obligations under the blight removal uh, funding agreement with the Housing Authority acting as the LCRA, the Land Clearance Redevelopment Authority. Um, the City Council previously appropriated $259,000 for this purpose. Uh, earlier this summer, the City received an invoice from the Housing Authority uh, triggered by the uh, sale of 501, 507, 511 and 513 East Capitol, which uh, has exhausted the originally appropriated uh, money for this um, for this project, and still requires the uh, $50,000 to uh, cover the obligation. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Mullman or council discussion, Councilman Graham? Uh, yes, I received an email as well as phone call in regards to. Uh, this uh, particular bill in regards to the fifty thousand uh, dollars. I know we approved the two fifty nine. Uh, is there some reason why we are still short the fifty thousand dollars? We have to go back into we authorize additional monies from this two hundred fifty nine thousand dollars. Yeah. So um, the two hundred fifty the two hundred fifty nine thousand dollars was originally appropriated for phase one of this project which covered three properties and so uh, the housing authority has uh, managed to use that money to acquire uh, two properties or they've acquired all three properties in phase one and have uh, conveyed two of those properties out of phase one and in addition they've been able to acquire I believe seven more properties and uh, and then reconvey the reconvey back out to the public five of those properties so that two hundred fifty nine thousand dollars was originally meant to cover three properties uh, the Housing Authority has been able to stretch that money into um, doing my math here uh, seven properties and so um, we've actually gotten a pretty good bang for our buck uh, I believe uh, out of that original 259 it's just we've we've, we've kind of ended the magic and we have to kind of re-up that uh, to get to uh, to address this last set of properties so are there some additional properties going to require more funding uh, possibly so uh, 501 sorry 101 Jackson is a property that was acquired under phase one that the housing authority is still trying to find a buyer for I think they may also be contemplating um, whether or not they have some their own purposes there's a vacant lot behind 501 that I believe that they're trying to do a consolidation with 
and then there is a, another property that is a parking lot also on Jackson Street that they that they still have so I guess I have another question in regards to um, I know this is coming from my general fund and I know that right now we're sitting just at 17 point zero something uh, percent so I'm wondering um, where do we find this fifty thousand three hundred fifty seven dollars and sixty cents from well this bill uh, is requesting that it be brought out of out of the general fund um, so if this bill does not pass we still owe the money it would have to be fine found somewhere else so we're bound to this fifty thousand yes So, so just as kind of a reminder, and I believe this is back in 2017 when we entered into this agreement with the Housing Authority, there's, there's a lot of unknown and a lot of risk that goes into the project. And so essentially the Housing Authority um, uh, worked to identify properties that it wanted to acquire, and, and, and then the City Council essentially uh, acceded to that to that uh, to that request that was both for phase one and phase two without knowing how much they would be acquired for and how much they were able to sell for and so um, it was contemplated within the blight funding agreement that that in this process the city would be taking on some risk about about future costs and so um, so there there is an element of unknown when undertake, undertaking this project because at the time we have uh, at the time we pass the agreement there, there's just no way to know how much the court would uh, value these lands and how much the housing authority would be able to sell it for and so this is the that's the reality of this risk now is is that um, that we're faced with obligations that we are required to pay under our agreement with the housing authority that um, that uh, haven't yet been identified yeah, I mean, so I, I support uh, what we're doing, but certainly I can see the concerns in which uh, the two individuals who reached out to me, I can see their concerns Absolutely. as citizens of Jefferson as relates to us approving a certain amount, and then we're going back to ask for additional funds uh, for, for, for these properties. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I support it, but on the other side, I certainly see their concerns as well too there was a fund do we stop yeah and, and apologize for cutting you off there. um there was a funding request that was made to the finance committee i believe back in 2019 when we kind of expanded into phase two uh the decision uh, of the committee at that time was essentially let's deplete what was already been appropriated without locking up future money um, essentially the discussion was um you know whether or not we wanted to um freeze money for this program in budget year 2019 because we weren't sure if that extra money was actually going to be needed in 2019 uh, that proved to be prescient because we didn't need that money in 2019 we're only now needing it here at the end of, of 2020 and so that was a decision that was brought in front of the finance committee um, and, and you know that's that's that was the decision we made is to really to spin down the original amount before going back for for more in my last statement then I promise to be quiet I just um, I think that someone should have a conversation with the housing authority let them know that you know at, at some point when we, we, we budgeted this amount at, at some point I mean we just can't keep going into a a, a, a checkbook uh, and we're having tough times now so sure. at some point we're going to need to know some definite number that we can't exceed because I mean I just I, I can see the concerns in which the two constituents of mine had. So sure. That's all I want to say. Councilman Fitzwater. Well, I, I certainly understand the concerns that, that you share, Councilman, and you know we've had discussions on the budget, the dollars available, and in our fund balances. I did have the privilege of being a liaison to the Housing Authority for the last three years, and. I can tell you they agonized over these properties and struggled. I think Mr. Melman indicated that we made these projections well in advance, certainly not anticipating a tornado or other impacts on that part of town. I'm not saying a tornado impacted those houses, but it impacted people's philosophy about whether they wanted to move and take a risk on some of those properties and time has not been
kind of those properties. You know, legal counsel struggled with as we acquired those properties and trying to get them on the market as quickly as possible. But I can tell you that, that the housing authority struggled and they did everything they could. They pulled some properties back, tried to re take them to the market and do it a little bit more creatively. So I mean I think you would hear you would have receptive ears over there that you know they're frustrated also. But again I think we've gone through a lot and it's one of those things that we're going to look back on that Capitol Avenue project and say this was worth it for the city of Jefferson. It's a little bit more money than we anticipated three or four years ago maybe, but we've got to see it to fruition and I, mean, I, I think they are doing a great job of a very difficult process. I would agree and I commend the council for moving this process forward and, and also I think for um, working through it at the finance committee level this is something that is coming up now because the right decision was made to incorporate um, cash flow and timing and it could have been taken out at the time but made more sense to take it as incurred so I think that's really why if, if the public could understand that's part of the reason why it's coming forward now and that it is a much better value to pay the housing authority and turn these homes over to private development and get them back um, into productive properties rather than the alternative because we still have the risk that's involved it would simply be a risk of uh, or a liability to the city and, and a cost associated with it of um, demolition of the structure so um, we would still have that cost so it's a much better value now whether the two people that contacted you would understand or see that that side of it um, it's a liability for us regardless so we're going to get a much better return on our investment for putting these properties back um, into uh, better use so um, any further questions or deliberation um, roll call please Lester aye Schreiber aye vote aye Ward aye Wiseman Fitzwater aye Grand aye Hensley aye Hussey aye Kimna aye bill passes 2020-16, an ordinance of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, authorizing the mayor and city clerk to return funds back to the State of Missouri Department of Economic Development to close out the U.S. Housing and Urban Development Neighborhood Stabilization Program. Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Madam Mayor. As the clerk uh, mentioned, that this is a supplemental appropriation request to uh, basically close out the Neighborhood Stabilization Program and remove federal ties from 408 Lafayette. Uh, the money, uh, through communication with HUD and DED, uh, they have told us that that money will go back into our account that we can draw down on other eligible uh, basically HUD uh, uh, financed uh, programs such as we do with our community development block program infrastructure down payment assistance etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, so the money it will come back to the city uh, through that little cycle I could go through the uh, history of the property but basically what happened is once we acquired it we did work on it the floodplain maps change the 50 percent rule kicked in uh, which would prohibit us to actually to do any more work for at least two more years but then that's a rolling 10-year calculation they do uh, and uh, basically we would not be able to uh, uh, do what we intended with that uh, piece of property in terms of making uh, low and moderate income housing. Uh, so uh, once that money is paid back, the city council can do as they wish with that property and we will be providing a, uh, a, a memo or note of what the options are and what the pros and cons are. Uh, with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Okay, roll call please. Schreiber? Aye. Vote? Aye. Ward? Aye. Aye. Wiseman? Fitzwater? Aye. Graham? Aye. Hensley? Aye. Lassie? Aye. Kimna? Aye. Lester? Aye. Bill passes. Nothing on the informal. Item 15, resolutions 2026. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Jefferson, Missouri authorizing application for a survey project through the Historic Preservation Fund grant. Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is a grant application to uh, basically resurvey the historic east side. Uh, when it was initially surveyed in 1992, uh, uh, several properties were omitted. Uh, therefore, uh, if a, a National Register application uh, was going forward, it would sort of create a limbo situation where they, they wouldn't have information on all the properties. The uh, total project, uh, based on previous projects like this, would be uh, 
$23,000, the federal share would be $13,800, and then $9,200 would be the city match if we got the grant. Um, and uh, basically the survey looks at construction dates, history of the property, any alterations to the building, architectural details, styles, things like that, so that uh, that would help support a National Register nomination. Be glad to answer any questions. Any questions? Do we have a motion to approve? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Vote. Aye. Ward. Aye. Wiseman. Fitzwater. Aye. Graham. Aye. Hensley. Aye. Hussey. Aye. Kimna. Aye. Lester. Aye. Schreiber. Aye. Resolution passes. Resolution 2027. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Jefferson, Missouri, authorizing application for a survey project through the Historic Preservation Fund grant. Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is the same uh, a grant program, actually, for the same purpose, but to uh, go ahead with Phase 2 of the West Main Street uh, survey. Uh, we'd like to go ahead and finish off the uh, south side of Main Street and over on the east end a little bit, uh, some of the, the properties on the north, and focusing on especially where the Y is, where, where, where High Street and uh, Main kind of kind of less there. Uh, the dollar amounts are the same. We anticipate a $23,000 uh, total project, uh, 13800 federal share, and a $9,200 city match. A little bit of that can be in-kind service, but we don't anticipate a lot that the city staff could do with that project. Uh, with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Ward? Aye. Wiseman? Fitzwater? Aye. Graham? Aye. Hensley? Aye. Hussey? Aye. Kimna? Aye. Lester? Aye. Schreiber? Aye. Vote? Aye. Resolution passes. Resolution 2028. A resolution providing instruction to Mayor Carrie Turgeon to vote yes on the MSP Community Improvement District ballot. Mr. Mullman. Thank you. Um, the City Council recall, uh, recalls it approved the uh, establishment of the MSP Community Improvement District uh, back in June. Uh, shortly after that, the uh, Board of Directors of the MSP Community Improvement District met and voted to put on the ballot of property owners within the CID, within the district, uh, for a 1% sales tax um, within for sales on uh, on taxable sales within the district um, so pursuant to that vote uh, in accordance with the community improvement district act the county clerk is currently conducting a mail-in election of all property owners uh, all three of us uh, which includes the city the state and uh, Stid barony llc this resolution would authorize the mayor to vote yes on that ballot uh, on behalf of the city who is voting as a property owner. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Or a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Wiseman? Fitzwater? Aye. Graham? Aye. Hensley? Aye. Hussey? Aye. Kimna? Aye. Lester? Aye. Schreiber? Aye. Vote? Aye. Ward? Aye. Resolution passes. Resolution 2029. A resolution extending an emergency declaration and further proclamations there under until September 7th, 2020. Mr. Mullman. Thank you. This resolution would extend the mayor's emergency proclamation uh, regarding the global outbreak of COVID-19 and uh, proclamations that have been issued there under. The proclamations uh, that are, are being extended include the emergency proclamation regarding temporary signs, the emergency proclamation regarding electronic participation in city meetings, and the emergency proclamation mandating masks be worn at city public meetings. This would extend these proclamations uh, through September 7th. Thank you. Any questions or discussion or a motion in favor? So moved. So Second. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Fitzwater? Aye. Graham? Aye. Hensley? Aye. Hussey? Aye. Kimna? Aye. Lester? Aye. Schreiber? Aye. Vote? Aye. Ward? Aye. Wiseman? Resolution passes. Item 16, presentations from the gallery on other topics. Is there anyone signed up this evening? No. Okay. Anyone here to speak? Anyone on the phone? No. Okay. Thank you. Item 17, council and staff discussion of presentation topics. 
Item 18, any new business? Uh, I will add something I forgot during my announcements here that uh, I am working on raising money for Habitat for Humanity. They're doing their Road to Recovery build and there is a, a mayor's build uh, on Jackson Street. There's many homes that they're trying to, to build right now. I know that several of you have been engaged and involved with um, Habitat and, and helping. So uh, there's many organizations that are either offering assistance to get out there and work or donate money. So if anyone's interested, uh, I have a small little, instead of a bake sale, I've got some of my old mayoral t-shirts that I've been given for from many organizations over the last several years. So uh, selling them, they're in my office if anybody's interested. I'll take whatever you want to give for them. I've raised about $68 so far and I'd like to get to 100 So if anybody wants to buy a shirt for 5 or 10 bucks, uh, feel free to do that. So um, whatever we can do to uh, raise money and, and put it towards Habitat would be appreciated for their road to recovery. Um, with that, we have item 19, closed session. Ms. Donaldson, would you read the resolution? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Uh, to go back to announcements, yes. um, the Human Relations Online Speaker Event is on still for this Thursday, starting at 6.30 to 8 p.m., and it's Stronger Through Diversity. Um, they have a variety of speakers, and it's an online Facebook event. Great. Well, we appreciate that. And so if it's online on Facebook, hopefully we could all tune in even after the fact since we'll be doing our budget meeting uh, during that time. But uh, appreciate that. So this Thursday night, this uh, Stronger Through Diversity. Thank you. Any other um, any other things for old business or, announce or new business? Um, item 19, closed session. Mrs. Donaldson will read the resolution. Pursuant to Section 61021 of the Revised Statutes of Missouri, the Chair will entertain a motion to go into closed session to discuss real estate, Section 610021, Subsection 2. Is there a motion? Second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Hensley? Aye. Hussey? Aye. Kimna? Aye. Buster? Aye. Schreiber? Aye. Vote? Aye. Ward? Aye. Wiseman? Fitzwater? Aye. Graham? Aye. Okay, we'll be moving into closed session in this room, so we'll give five minutes to clear the room out, five minutes or less.